His uh, just finished his first year of Bible college, and uh, so uh, as I remember, uh, you, you pretty much know it all after a year of Bible college. So uh, you'll want to come and hear all about that tonight. And then in two weeks from today, my dad will be with us all day. He'll be here uh, Sunday school, Sunday night. He'll be preaching and then be with us all day as well. So you uh, come and be a part of these things. We'd love to have you. Uh, Genesis chapter 7. There had never been anything like it before, nor will there ever be anything like it again. The flood was the greatest flood to ever take place on the face of the earth. Now understand, this is not a story just about judgment, the story about the flood. It's also a story about grace. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, there was judgment, but there was an ark as well in the midst of that judgment. And so Noah spent all those years while he was preparing and building that ark, uh, he spent preaching on the grace of God. And may I say today, every creature needs a preacher. Amen? And so uh, grateful for that. Let's read as we look at Genesis 7, starting at verse number 10. And uh, you, uh, you be patient with my voice today. I have been waiting for years for my voice to change. And I'm excited it seems like it's finally happening. <laughs> Genesis 7, verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and in that 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the deep, of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Now, jump down to verse number 17. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth that the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly above the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered and all flesh died that moved upon the earth both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land. Got a lot of alls there. Did you catch that? Alls. All means all, and that is all that all means. Amen? Now, verse 23, And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. The waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. Father, I pray you'd help us this morning. This is a well-known story. We've seen pictures, even movies maybe, about this event. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, probably misinformation given to us, especially from the world, about the flood. Help us today, Lord, gain spiritual truth and practical helps from it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> of course, as you can imagine... There are many critics of the flood. Now, most scientists do admit that a flood of some sort helped to cause the fossil and geological formations of the earth. They concede that it must have been some sort of great flood, but they do not want to accept Noah's flood because then they have to accept God's judgment on sin, something that they heavily reject, obviously, as secular thinkers. But while modern science rejects the flood, Jesus Christ did not reject it. In fact, he affirmed it. In Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married, wives were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them. Here's that word again, all. Yet there's another issue that people have with the flood that this is not a scientific issue, it's a morality issue. And that is the idea of divine judgment. How could uh, God, a God of love, how they just can't reconcile that God would cause such a great tragedy to come on the face of the earth and such horror to so many people. Divine judgment is very hard for people to accept as they read the Old Testament. The Bible says in verse six, uh, 
chapter 6, verse 11, that the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The problem was, of course, the abundance of human violence on the earth. And that is what was going on in the days just before the flood. Now, human violence wins if you don't believe in the doctrine of divine judgment. You watch nature shows. Lions eat gazelles. Polar bears eat seals. Wolves eat rabbits. Bears eat whatever they want, pretty much. Uh, we see that and we think, no big deal. You, you see a nature, it's a part of nature. It's just what happens in the food chain and all that. But then uh, everything's natural until a man kills a man or until a man violates a woman. Now we have a problem. Why? Well, if you don't believe in God, you can't have a problem with it. It's just nature. It's just what happens. You have to believe in the supernatural to even complain about violence. How do you forgive those that commit violence against you? That's another aspect of this as well. Robert Godwin Sr. was 74 years old. Uh, murdered in April 16, 2017, while walking on a sidewalk in Cleveland. The murderer was 37-year-old Stephen Stevens, later dubbed the Facebook murderer, who posted a cell phone video of him shooting the victim. He posted it on his own Facebook account. Smart guy, isn't it? Two days later, he turned the gun on himself when cornered by police. Now, what's interesting is the family was interviewed. I saw the interview. Uh, two sisters and a, a brother, I believe, uh, were interviewed on CNN by Anderson Cooper. And he, uh, while he was talking to them, uh, this is what one of the sisters said, that we forgive Mr. Stevens. The anchor was quite shocked. He says, really? You forgive him? She said, we are believers in Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. And then she said this, and I quote, I promise you I could not forgive him if I did not know God. Now, you see, we can forgive because we know that while we are not the judge, we believe in one who is the judge. Divine judgment is the only way we can come to terms with human violence. It's really the only way we can forgive someone because we know that, uh, that, that you know, I can't, I don't know what that man deserves, but God does, and God will take care of it in the end. But I'd like to point something else out here. If you're bothered by divine judgment, you're not alone. In fact, if you kind of look at the flood and, and a great tragedy like that, and how many people died because of it, and it just makes you recoil in horror from it, you're not the only one. Look at chapter 6, a page back here, <coughs> and verse number 5. The Bible says, and God saw that the wickedness on the earth was very great. Or the man, a man was great in the earth. And that every imagine, listen to this, this conclusive statement here. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a lot of, it's like uh, pushing the point there. Every thought, only evil and evil continually. That means there was no, you know, even you take the most wicked society today and there's some good that comes from it. Not this one. This one was evil, only evil, and it was only evil continually. They tried to imagine ways to be more evil. This is a terrible verse. So here's the judge. He sees the condition. He evaluates what needs to happen. Look what it says. Every imagination was only evil continually. And verse 5 then shows us the necessity of judgment. Now verse 6 shows us the problem of judgment. Read that with me. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. What does God do when he sees what has to be done? What's his response? His heart is filled with pain. You hate judgment? God hates judgment more. But he's a holy God. It has to happen. He must judge sin because he's holy. Uh, but his heart was grieved, the Bible said. Now, the word grieved here is an intense word. We see it again, same original word in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 6, when the Bible says, For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou wast refused. A 
a therapist will tell you that one of the most traumatic things you can go through as a human being is to be deserted by your spouse. Yet that's the kind of pain God said he felt here. He was grieved. I want to look at the flood today and how we can apply some of these things practically. Uh, looking first at the coming of the flood. For years, the people of the earth had been warned about coming judgment. We know that because Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. You see, Noah wasn't just a carpenter. He didn't just build the ark. He was preaching while he did it. He probably set up, uh, if, if a crowd gathered, as no doubt they often did, he might have paused and laid down his tools and got up and preached the righteousness of God, the Bible says. He would have preached the grace of God and what needed to happen if they wanted to save themselves. Uh, the preaching and building of Noah are two warnings that God gave to these people that judgment was coming. The preaching by his words and the building by showing them that judgment is coming and the fact that he was building a boat. God had told Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Genesis 6.13 Then seven days before the flood, God told Noah, yet seven days and I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights. That's chapter 7, verse 4. Now the seven days has passed, and the waters of the flood were on the earth, Genesis 7.10. The coming of the flood is a warning to man to stop mocking the messages of divine judgment. It is something for us to look at today too because it's human nature for us to mock judgment that doesn't come quickly. If judgment doesn't come immediately, then the mockers will think that it will never come. In fact, there's a passage in the New Testament about this. You've been talking about the return of Christ for years and it's not happened yet. Who's to say it'll happen now? Imagine, <coughs> along with me, if sin's consequences were immediate, how much less sin there would be. Imagine. I mean, uh, somebody sins just once, and the consequences are... That's not how sin works. Sin's consequences are down the road because God's gra God, God is a, a God of grace. But people who live wickedly and then find that there's no immediate consequences often think, they won't have to pay for sin. They sin, they keep sinning, and they do so with abandonment, but sooner or later, they'll have to they'll, they show up at the doctor's office with lung cancer or they uh, or with a pickled liver because of liquor, or sooner or later, Im immorality will wreak its havoc on their lives. Those mockers are described well in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 8.11, he says, because sentence against an evil work are not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. What he's saying is there is just because the consequences don't come on you quickly, you continue in your sin. Look, you, you can take all kinds of examples in society around us today, but uh, we know that sin causes bad consequences, yet we still do it. Why? Because the consequences are so far down the road. And often the devil lies to us and tells us that you know, we're different. We might escape them altogether. The ungodly world would mock Noah and laugh at his building project, the ark. But when the flood came, all that stopped. Scripture promises judgment on sin and on the earth. Do not mock because it hasn't happened yet. Jesus Christ is coming back one day and I believe it to be soon. Do not mock because he hasn't returned yet. Just because we are in a time of grace just because there's yet more time given to us, we don't take advantage of that and mock it. We uh, should take advantage and get right with God in it. Amen. Don't be like the mockers in Noah's day who despise the warning of the judgment. Then look at number verse, uh, verse number 16. Scary verse here, chapter 7, verse 16. The Bible says, the Lord shut him in. This would be dramatic. After they were all in the ark, the unseen hand of God would close the door. There were a lot of miracles connected with Noah and the ark. This was one of them, that God himself shut the door. The fact that Noah was shut in meant that all others were shut out. Grace was no longer available to them. Judgment has come. The rejectors have no more opportunities to repent. Imagine along with me when the flood waters began, the rain was falling, 
and the water started to rise, how some would pound and beg on the door to be let in the ark. Imagine the desperation, the wailing and crying that Noah and his family had to listen to. But he didn't close the door. I don't believe he could open the door. The door was shut to grace. The time had gone. Now it was too late. They had their chance and it was too late. What a terrible, terrible place to be in. But oh dear friend, this will happen again. There is again coming a day where we stand before God, and if you don't bend your, or bow your knee today, it will be too late then. Uh, there's coming a time uh, where we have been, who have been riding on the mercy and long-suffering of God your whole life, or you may even despise God, or you may deny the existence of God. The very God whose existence you deny is giving the breath you breathe today that allows you to deny Him. Uh, things may be going well for you currently, you may be set for life. You may be like the men of Athens when they said, we'll hear again of this matter, Acts 17.32. You might be like King Agrippa, who says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, Acts 26.28. But one day, my friend, it'll be too late. Don't put it off. If you're in here today or under the sound of my voice and you've never accepted the gift of salvation, don't put it off another day. If you don't know that you know that you know that you'll be in heaven one day, Get in the ark today and get that settled. Greatest tragedy in the world is to spend eternity in judgment when there's a way out. Especially when there's a way out. And there was a way out. For these people, it was the ark. For us, it's the ark of salvation. But the opportunity for salvation is not forever. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. You saw it as your memory verse in the back of the bulletin this week. And now is the time or the, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It makes sense because yesterday is gone. You can do nothing about yesterday. Tomorrow is only a promise and a hope. You don't have, it's not a promise, it's a hope. You're not promised tomorrow. You don't know if you'll be around tomorrow. You, yesterday is gone. Today is the only day you have for sure. That's what the Bible says. Today is the day of salvation. Then the rain came. Verse number 10, it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Now I'd like to compare it to verse 4 where it says, For yet seven days I will cause it to rain on the earth. God had promised, now God delivers. Here, here's an interesting thing, if you look at the story practically. Noah had to wait a few days before the rain began. Now I always like to try to enter the mental thinking of what was going on then. For a hundred years he'd been building an ark. Building, building, building. Well, we're going to be, and, he, and during that time, they're making fun of him. I mean, they're having the greatest time in the world. Can you imagine the mocking? He's building a boat. It had never rained before. That's what God came to Noah and said, Noah, you need to build a boat. It's going to rain. Yes, sir. What's rain? They had no idea what rain was. Never rained before. And now he's building a boat out there in the middle of no water because one day, yeah, it's going to rain. Water's going to fall from the sky. That'd be as odd to them as if I were to tell you that one day pizza's going to fall from the sky. You know, it, it was crazy to them. They'd never heard of it before. Now he's in the ark. Day one, it's done. It's not raining yet. Now the jeering really got heavy out there. Hey, I thought you said it's going to rain when you get done. Day two, day three, still not raining. I think if there was ever any, I'm not saying there was. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say but I think if there was ever any doubt in Noah's mind, it would have been in this seven-day period. But when it was done, everything's ready. Hey, Lord, you said that when I, I need to build it out because it's going to rain. Kind of waiting for the rain right now. And it's not happening yet. The outside world would be laughing and jeering. Noah's act of going in the ark really looked like insanity when it did not rain. I wonder, Brother Corey, if we're not in that seven-day period right now. I don't know. I'm not trying to make any kind of predictions here, but Christians are ready to go. We're all packed. We're expecting the return of Christ, but God is extending His grace just a little bit further. Maybe your dad needs to be saved. Maybe your grandfather or your grandchild or your daughter or your son or someone you love still needs to be saved, and God is giving grace in that seven days' time. I really believe this. You can argue the point and... The Bible is not clear, so neither one of us can really prove the other wrong. But I really believe in that seven-day period, every human being on the earth could have gotten on that ark before God shut the door 
And uh, so there was a last bit of grace. He had given a hundred years. You say, how could God destroy everybody? He had given them a hundred years to get on that ark. And now I gave another seven days. Hey, I'm doing everything I can to get you on the ark. They didn't get on the ark. Same is true in salvation. How could a loving God send somebody to hell forever and ever and ever? I've heard that from so many people. Can I tell you something, friend? If you die and go to hell, it's not God that sends you there. God sent His Son, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son. He, he, he sent His Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then, not only did He send His life to pay for your sin on the cross of Calvary, He made it free to you. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, self, uh, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I ask you, friend, what more could God do than make it free? Get in the ark. Get in the ark. There came a time when it was too late. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 again. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Friend, I ask you today, don't put off a decision that needs to be made now. They were in the ark seven days. Sometimes God tests our faith like that. God tells us to do something. We obey, but then for a period of time, we see no results. Even those close to us might begin to question our actions. I wonder if Noah's sons, uh, Dad, how long do we stay in this place if it doesn't ever rain? You know, around day five, day six. But if God says it will rain, it's going to rain. If God said, that's what Jesus said in John, 14, uh, Ch John chapter 14, he says, if I go... I will return. He went. He's coming back. Okay, so he's always done everything he's ever said before, and there's no reason to doubt him now. Noah had for years been mocked and rejected of men for his belief in his behavior. Can I tell you that our faith might be scorned, but can I tell you something else? Time always vindicates faith. Always. Always. Then we'll look at the cause of the flood. I don't want to go into this. De I, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I've uh, enjoyed reading up on some of this stuff. But the Bible says uh, three sources here of the, of the water for the flood. The first we see in chapter 7, verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This wasn't a light sprinkle. We're talking about a great downpour. 40 days and 40 nights. It had never rained before. Uh, before this, the ground had been watered by a mist, the Bible says. And uh, so now we see a continuous rain for 40 days and 40 nights. That was a long time to rain nonstop, just two days short of six weeks. Sump pumps were working over time, amen. 40 days, continuous rain. And then a second uh, source in verse number 11. The windows of heaven were opened. This is another one of three ways that God brought the flood waters to the earth. Now, it did not have the same source that the rain. The rain came from the clouds. The water came from the sky. I believe these windows of heaven is talking about the, uh, the, the firmament that was around the earth. talks about in Genesis. I believe this changed our atmosphere and our climate. This would lead uh, that, that uh, increased atmospheric pressure that that water would have allowed to be on our planet, would have allowed uh, humans to live a lot longer than we do today. It would allow animals to grow a lot bigger than they did uh, than they do today, like almost, I think of a word, dinosaur, something like that, amen, uh, could have lived even in that time. So the release of this water from the sky would uh, then cause the flooding to occur quickly. The Bible tells us the judgment of the flood came quickly upon the earth. And then there was a third source here we see in uh, verse 11, the same day were all the fountains of the deep. Broke, uh, the great deep broken up. The third source of water was the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep. Broken up means to split, break open, divide, break up, tear. Great volcanic type eruptions of water would have been taking place. These subterranean reservoirs were, a, were, were the sprinkling systems spoke about in Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 when the mist watered the earth. So the flood waters came from both above the earth's surface and below the earth's surface but a lot of water in a very quick amount of time. The eruption of these uh, reservoirs would produce enormous amounts of water. 
think of the tremendous chaos going on in the world at this time. Before the unbelievers perished, they would have experienced so much terror and confusion. When the judgment of the flood came, they learned very quickly what Hebrews 10.31 tells us. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. When God judges, it comes from every direction. All was peaceful and quiet for them. Then suddenly from the skies and from the ground come massive amounts of water. Flooding and chaos was everywhere. Verses 19 and 20, And the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits, that's over 22 feet. Upward did the water prevail and the mountains were covered. I don't believe this is 15 feet uh, above sea level. I think it's 15 feet, or 22 feet above the highest mountain. That's why the Bible says the mountains were covered. Now, I do believe that the pre-flood conditions, uh, the, the world was a lot more level than it is in the post-flood world. I believe the mountains and many hills were, uh, a lot of them were formed by the upheaval of the, of the waters from the deep. But what mountains did exist, the Bible says, they were covered. This was not a local flood. The Bible says all flesh died upon the earth. If it was a local flood, why did Noah have to build an ark? He could have relocated his family. He had a hundred years to do it. Could have just went to another area if it was a local flood. Uh, remember in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that was a local judgment. What did Lot do? He moved just a little bit out of the way to avoid the judgment. This wasn't a local judgment. It was a worldwide judgment. And God told him to build an ark. Second thing you could talk about too in Genesis chapter 9, God says he's given a rainbow to promise that there'll never be another flood like this before. Uh, I mean, uh, never be another flood like this again. Have we had floods? Lots of them. If our floods was that flood, then that rainbow is a lie. And it's not a lie because God does not lie. It was a worldwide flood. The flood, the duration of the flood is just a little over a year. Sake of time, not going to go into all the verses, but Genesis 8, 4, 8, 5, 8, 13, 8, 14. Uh, and chapter 7, verse 11 through 12, give us the timeline. It was uh, one year and ten days that they were on that ark. And then the carnage from the flood. It was tremendous. God literally wiped out a civilization, except for Noah and his family. One of the problems with mankind today is that it does not take serious this issue of sin. Sin is a serious thing. We can laugh at it, we can joke about it, we can take it lightly, but sin is a serious thing. I think it's a tragedy that we allow ourselves to view, even on television today, wickedness, and we just allow it to come into our homes via that way. But sin is serious. If it is not repented of, it's going to bring great judgment on that sinner. And yet, carnal man will always complain about the severity of divine judgment. You hear it all the time. How could a loving God do that? Well, they'll criticize God for overreacting, often as a simple excuse to cling to their sins. Sinners will complain when you deal forcefully with sin. That's why preachers who preach strong sermons on sin are often criticized. That's why the disciplining of children is so opposed today. I was in a restaurant two days ago, and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a child really scream. I mean really scream, where it hurts deep in your ears. And it was just, and my blood pressure would, <sighs> just when I heard it, it was just horrible. And I wanted to, you know, obviously there's absolutely no discipline on that end. I wanted to, Offer my services, but nobody's often interested in that. It's why the punishment of criminals is so lenient in our day today. Those who deal forcefully with evil are accused of being deficient in love. And that's not the case at all. It, it, our world has gotten backwards. The same person who is pro-abortion pro-killing babies, innocent babies in a womb, will hold a candle for a convicted murderer who's about to be put to death. That's a backwards way of thinking, isn't it? Why? Because we don't look serious on sin. We don't take sin seriously. And God takes it very seriously. The complaints that we have about the flood being too 
uh, extreme is because we don't see the extreme sinfulness of sin. The great carnage of the flood shows us what God thinks of sin. You may say, oh, preacher, you know, I just don't think that LGBTQ, E-I-E-I-O, I don't think that's such a big deal today. God thinks it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Sin is a big deal. Right is right, though all condemn it. Wrong is wrong, though all condone it. Noah only remain, remained alive. And all those that were with him in the ark, Genesis 7.23. The emphasis here is in the place of the escape. It was in the ark. That escape was available to everyone. There was no charge for the ticket. It was free. Anyone could come on the ark and be saved. All that were in the ark escaped the carnage of this judgment. Those outside the ark had no protection whatsoever. The ark was the only protection from the wrath of God. When the, while the, yes, the judgment was severe. Yes, it was terrible. Yes, the carnage was awful. But God made a way for every single soul to escape it. It was their choice not to take that way of escape. God does not send judgment ever without a way to escape it. Those who perished in the flood not only lived wicked lives, but they rejected God's way of escape and His compassion. That only magnifies their sin. They rejected the opportunity to get on the ark, even as many people today scorn the gospel, don't want to have anything to do with it, don't talk to me about religious things, I'm just fine, I'll be okay. They scorn the escape. They don't recognize their sin, and they, they don't want to have anything to do with getting uh, Jesus Christ in their life. In that way, people that go to hell deserve it. I deserve to go to hell. Every one of us deserve it. I'm not saying I wish anybody there, but they cannot blame God for being cruel. They can only blame themselves because God has made a way to escape. And listen, friend, if you're under the sound of my voice today, maybe later via online, but if you're listening to this message right now and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can never point to God and tell Him it's His fault. The way is clear. Jesus Christ has paid the price for you. Get in the ark. That's what Noah's message was. The fact that so few were saved in the ark. That's a disheartening thing. You know why? Because of what we read earlier when I first started the message, what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You know what's going to happen when Jesus comes back? Years ago, you might have seen this too. Years ago, I, I saw a picture of the rapture. Have you ever seen that where there's a plane coming down, cars are all side. Uh, buildings are blowing up. I mean, it's just like mass carnage when the rapture takes place because, you know, the saved pilot went to heaven and these all these people are... I, I don't think it's going to be that noticeable. Honestly, just my opinion. I mean, statistically speaking, how many people will go to heaven? I mean, I hope many, many people go, but I'm, I'm wondering, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, only eight people were saved. I don't know. I hope that's not the case, but uh, that's what the Bible says here, and if we want to apply it that way. If we do follow the Savior, we won't be popular. We'll be in the vast minority like Noah and his family were if we follow the Savior. Noah was not popular. Those who follow Christ today are not popular. You don't have to watch the news long to see that. William Penn said, avoid popularity. It has many snares and no real benefit. We're not out to be popular. We're out to be right. When a Christian lives a life of separation <coughs> or abstains from the practices of the world, you always hear criticism like, Christian's life is so restrictive. You Christians can't have any fun at all. The truth is, any restrictions put on a Christian's life are, have the purpose of unrestricted blessing in the future. Now, this is perfectly demonstrated in the art. When Noah's in the ark and his family's in there, think about that seven-day period. Hey, having a party? Come on over. Nope, not going to take a part of that. You guys are so restricted. Stuck in that ark. You guys can't do anything. Can't have any fun. The restriction looked pretty good a week later. You follow what I'm saying? The restrictions, the standards that we put in our Christian lives 
give us many blessings in the future. The separated Christian life is not popular today, but it was a great way to a great blessing. The same waters that destroyed life on the ark uh, life on the earth bore the ark that saved Noah and his family. Oh, can I tell you today, get in the ark. Get in the ark. Don't be one of those people that just uh, shuns the compassion and the grace and the mercy of God. God is calling to you today just as He did to Noah. He provided a way for you. We go back to Genesis chapter one, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible says that God said unto Noah, Come into the ark. If God brings judgment, mankind thinks that God is cruel and harsh, yet God gave these people 120 years to repent. Then He gave them an additional seven days to get into the ark. He did everything He could. Then He came to Noah and said, Come into the ark. That meant Noah was going to escape the judgment of God. Judgment never comes unless the compassion of God is demonstrated first. I love that word, come. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word "come" indicates another wonderful truth. God didn't say go. Didn't say go. He said, "Come in the ark." Where's God at? God's in the ark. Amen. He's with Noah. He's going to be with him in there. This call uh, to Noah declares God's presence with him. And Noah had walked with God. Genesis six nine tells us that now God would be with him during this fearful flood time. Noah's message is very simple. The lesson we can take from Noah's story is very simple. Get in the ark. Yes, judgment's coming. Yes, judgment is terrible. Yes, horrible things are ahead for sinners who reject Christ. So don't reject Christ. Get into the ark. The message is very simple today. Get Christ in your life. Don't put off until tomorrow a decision that needs to be made today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know, dear friend, today where this message found you. But I have prayed for it, prayed for you. I want to ask a couple of questions.